Okay. Uh, good evening. Let's get started. So this is uh, part two of our series on the fourth chapter of Bav Metziah, Parak Hazahav. Um, and we are on um, Daf Mem Dalet Amid Bet. Um, and we are going to continue our uh, attempt to figure out exactly what's what with uh is is gold money is gold not money is it gold it money compared to silver is it money compared to other things uh that we're going to continue that that discussion um and we begin with rava thinks that he's found a tana who has an opinion on the subject so that's where we start ah uh, rava hi tana savar dahava tabaha so Rava says, I found a Tana who thinks that gold is money. The Tanya, Prutasha Amru, Echad Mishmona Beisar Hayatalki. Because he says, I have this Brighta that set, gives uh, exchange rates for different uh, different kinds of money. A, it says a Pruta is um, an, an eighth of the value of an Italian Isar. Uh, and Pruta is sort of the the classic example of the smallest coin that's actually worth anything it is a it is a small copper coin uh and um the brighta says well who cares i i'm sorry this is the gemara inserting itself into the brighta the the things that i inset here are probably not actually part of the brighta they're probably um the discussion of the brighta that's gotten that's gotten included here um so it says So what 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 difference does it make? What what's what? Why are you? Why do we have a legal teaching about the um, uh, relative values of different coins? Um, and it says the kedusha isha, because in order to get married, uh, the most common, most normal method of getting married that we use is what we call kedusha kesef, the uh, getting married using money. And there's a dispute in the beginning of Masachet Kiddushin between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, what the minimum amount of money is to get married. And the position of Beit Hillel, which is the position that we rule like, uh, is that you need a minimum of a pruta. So you need to know how much a pruta is in order to know whether or not you've gotten married if somebody gave you uh, something which was worth some amount of money and you know how much that is in Italian Isars, but you don't know how much it is uh in Pruto. Uh and we saw in last week's um Gamara, we saw that there are some places where Pruto are money and some places where they are not. And I, I don't know exactly how common either of those kinds of places are. I don't know exactly where we're expected to be living and whether it's in those places or not. But it might be that we're experiencing a real life situation in the Gemara or in the Mishnah in which some people actually have access to this currency called the Pruta and other people do not, in which case it would actually make sense to have a, a conversion since it does seem to matter uh, how much a Pruta is. Okay. Um, the Brita goes on. Isar echad me esrim ve'arba bedinar shel kesef. So an Isar is one twenty-fourth of a silver dinar. Uh, and the Gemara again interrupts and says, Lamai nafkim, you know what difference does it make? And this time the answer is not quite as uh, satis satisfying, I would say. It says, Lameka um for buying and selling. Meaning, if I promised to sell something to you for three Isars, we need to know, you know whether or not you've paid me if you gave me money in a different uh in, in a different currency. Uh, but that answer really could work for any currency, any time that's not remotely specific to this situation. So it's at least not as much fun and possibly not as interesting um, as the as the other. Okay. Um, then the next currency that we have here is the... Uh, Dinar shel kesef, echad me'asrim v'chamisha b'dinar shel zahav. So the um, a silver dinar is one twenty fifth of a gold dinar. And the Gemara again interrupts and says, "L'may nafkim." You know what difference does that make? 
uh, lepidion haben for a pidion haben because a pidion haben has to be done with five silver coins, and um, it sounds like when we say it has to be done with five silver coins, I was just a little bit sloppy in my language there, but it sounds like the gemara is assuming that that doesn't actually mean you need to hand the Kohen silver coins. What you actually have to do is hand the Kohen money, which is worth as much as five silver coins. And, but you could pay him in a different currency and he could give you change. Um, it sounds like the point of this exchange rate is that I can actually give the Kohen a, um, a gold dinar and he'll give me back 20 um, silver dinars because I really only owed him five silver dinars. That 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 seems to be what the the straightforward meaning of this interpretation of the bright is. Okay, now what in the world does that have to do with whether gold is money? Let's let's follow Rava's logic here. Iamart bishlama tavahave mishayer tana bemidik the kites. So if you say it correctly, this is now Rava talking. If you say it correctly that gold is in fact money then the Tana in the Brighta is measuring his current one currency with uh, a, another uh, currency that has a fixed value. Meaning if you say that if you say that the, there are 25 silver dinars in one gold dinar, that really if you're gonna you know put put this into, a memorized text that you're then going to pass on to generations, that should be something which is, you know, always true. It shouldn't be something that you'd have to look up the exchange rate in this morning's newspaper to find out whether it's accurate or not. Um, and remember that we are assuming here in the Gemara that money has fixed value and that currencies have fixed exchange rates and that fluctuations in price reflect a change in the value of merchandise or commodities, whatever you want to call them, but something that's not money. Currency itself has has fixed value. Anything that fluctuates in value is, as far as the Gemara is concerned, definitionally not money. Because part of the definition of money is that it doesn't change value. Um, so Rav is saying, this Brighton makes sense. If you say that gold is money and you say that silver is money, then it makes sense to give an exchange rate between silver and gold because they both have fixed values the relationship between the values is fixed and so that that that's a sensible thing to have people memorize on the other hand ella yamart perahabe but if you say that it's merchandise uh, that's gold is merchandise then misha er tana bemidi de okir vizil then the tana is measuring his uh the value of his silver against something that, whose value goes up and down. And that doesn't, that, that's not stable. That's not something where it's worth measure, worth memorizing what the um, exchange rate is. As he goes on to explain, Zimnin de Mahadr le Kahana, the Zimnin de Mosif le Ihu le Kahana. So sometimes it, it's actually, if if gold can go up and down in value compared to silver, then this bright is not actually giving me any information about how to do pidyon haben, because sometimes uh, the kohen is going to have to give you change, and sometimes you're going to have to give the kohen more money because you won't have given him enough money yet if you try to pay him in gold because the gold isn't going to have a consistent relationship in value with the silver if the gold is going up and down in value. So el shmamina tavahave shmamina. So Rav says this bright proves conclusively that gold has a stable value and is treated as as currency as it's treated as money and um i don't want to hear any more of this uh gold being not money stuff okay but we're not done with it because of course we're never done with anything here so it's time to quote a mishnah so we're quoting a mishnah here in master shani and before we quote the Mishnah, we need some background information. Maser Shani is a sort of a tax, although it remains your property. So it's a very strange sort of tax. 
And the way it works is like this. First, when you finish processing your crops and you are got your grain all uh, threshed and winnowed and whatever, and it's it's ready to, to go into the silo or to go into the bags you're going to store it in, then it now you need to take your taxes from it. So first you take Truma, which doesn't have a minimum amount. That goes to a Kohen. Then you take off your Masa Rishon, which is 10%, uh, one-tenth of what's there. That goes to a Levi. Okay. That, what I've said so far is true every year except Shemitah. In Shemitah year, there are no taxes. But in every year that's not Shemitah, what I just said is true. The next step depends on what year it is of the Shemitah cycle. In years one, two, four, and five of the Shemitah cycle, your next step is going to be to take something called Maser Sheni. Maser Sheni is 10% of what's left, which is a little bit less than 90% of what you started with. So it's going to be a little bit less than 9% of what you started with. And the Maser Sheni needs to be separated from the rest of the crop but it belongs to you, and your job is to take it, to keep it uh, tahor, and to take it to Yerushalayim, and to eat it there in this state of tahara and kedusha. Now, the Torah recognizes that taking almost a tenth of all of your food to a city you don't live in and eating it there might be very inconvenient. Uh, and the Torah says if it's too far and God has blessed you with too much food, thank God, then you exchange the food for money and money doesn't spoil for one thing. And for another thing, it's much easier to carry because that you can keep the same value in a much smaller amount of stuff. And you can carry the money to Yerushalayim, buy any food and drink that you like there and eat that food instead in Yerushalayim. Okay. So this, 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 um, this process presumably uh, resulted in there being always an excess of food in the capital city, um, which presumably um, resulted in a, a feeling of uh, <coughs> prosperity and success and whatever, but also presumably just meant you didn't have like urban yuckiness in quite the same way as you might um, in, a, in a capital city where there was a lot of poverty. Um, Okay, in any case, our issue here is going to be, so you have taken your Maser Shani from several different crops. Thank God, God blessed you a lot this year. You've got a lot of a lot of food that you've produced. You're trading in your Maser Shani for money because there's no way you could bring that much food to Yerushalayim and eat it all at once. And as it happens, there, you also, you have a bunch of different crops and you took Maser Shani from each of them at a different time and what you ended up with is a big pile of money which is all in relatively small coins and you would like to hand in your copper or for silver or your silver for gold and to have less metal to carry around to carry to Yerushalayim you'd like to, to hand in all of your small change for a bigger coin. Okay, so th that's 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 our starting point here. So Tanan Hatam. The Mishnah says there, Beit Shammai Omrim, Lo Yase Adam Slaim Dinare Zahav. Beit Shammai says, you simply are not allowed to take your silver cellas um, and make them into gold cellas, gold dinari. And by make into, I think he means exchange. Okay, he just he doesn't allow it. You have to you have to take the silver money that you used to redeem the crops to Yerushalayim. Ubeit Hillel Matirin. But Beit Hillel does allow you to hand in the silver money for gold money before carrying it to Yerushalayim. And the question of exactly what they do and don't allow and exactly why they do and don't allow it is going to occupy us for the rest of this year and I believe for most of the next year as well. Okay, and in particular... Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish have a dispute about exactly what it is that Beit, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel are disputing about. Unfortunately, somebody a very long time ago lost track of who held which position in the dispute between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. 
And so we are going to be reduced to saying, well, one of them said this and one of them said that, but we don't know which one's which. Okay, so Rabbi Yochanan Varesh Lakish, Rabbi Yochanan Varesh Lakish, Chad Amar Machloket Bislaim al Dinarim. One of them said the dispute between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel is about whether you can exchange silver coins for gold coins. De Beit Shammai Savri Kaspa Tava Vidahava Peri Vitava Peri Lo Machalodian. Because Beit Shammai thinks that at least in relative terms, although maybe also in absolute terms, silver is money and gold is a commodity and you cannot take holiness from money and put it onto a commodity. Which is not quite accurate because you can and should take the holiness off of the money and put it back onto food when you get to Yerushalayim, when you're going grocery shopping for the food that you're going to eat to substitute for the food you were that you produced at home. Um, but either he means you can't take the sanctity off of the money and put it onto a commodity at home when you're not yet in Yerushalayim, which is true, or he means you can't put, take the money, off, the holiness off of the money and put it onto a commodity that's not edible, which is also true. I don't know which of those statements he's he's making, but either way, it would depend on gold not being money. Okay. Um Ubeit Hillel Savri, and according to this position, then Beit Hillel thinks, Kaspa Pera Vidahava Tava, that at least in a relative sense here, silver is the commodity and gold is the coin. Upeira Tava Machalinan, and you can absolutely take the holiness from a commodity and put it onto money. That's in fact the whole point of uh, redeeming Maser Shani, is that you take holiness from food and put it onto and put it onto money um so but but the according to this position of whichever of Beit Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan this is the dispute is only about the question of whether you can move the holiness from the silver coins onto the gold coins but about perot al dinarim but if I wanted to redeem my food directly using um using gold coins everybody would say that that would work you can remove the holiness from the food and put it directly onto gold according to everyone in this presentation the question is only with, about the relative uh moneyness of silver and gold not about the absolute possibility of using gold as money when compared to like actual food in this theory my tama why me need to have a kesef de beit hillel because it's like beit hillel's general position about silver kesef de beit hillel afalgav de kaspa legabe de hava pere hava for beit hillel even though silver, when you compare it to gold, silver is a commodity, legabe pere tavahave. As far as Beit Hillel is concerned, when you compare um, silver to food, to fruit, the silver is, is money, it's currency. So if Beit Hillel has a, a hierarchical structure, where everything is money compared to the thing below it on the structure, it, things below it on the hierarchy. And silver is money compared to food, but it's not money compared to gold. And gold is money compared to everything, as far as Beit Hillel is concerned. Okay. Zahav Nami Le Beit Shammai. So we're going to say this, Beit Shammai has a similar system. They just, their hierarchy is in a different order. So the gold, according to Beit Shammai, even though, according to Beit Shammai, gold is a commodity, it's merchandise when it's compared to silver, when you compare it to food, it would be money. Okay, so we everybody in this presentation, everybody agrees that there's a hierarchy. One metal is more money-like than the other metal, and both metals are money compared to food. They're just Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel switch, which is uh, above and which is below in the hierarchy of silver and gold. And that allows 
this presentation allows everybody to think that any kind of me of precious metal money can be used to redeem the food. The only question is wh whether you can then exchange coins for each other, and you can only exchange your coins for something that's higher in the hierarchy, not something that's lower. Okay. However, the other side of this version of the dispute, the Khadamar, the other one said, Af al dinarim machloket. They said there's also a machloket, there's also a dispute about the question of whether you can redeem food directly with gold. Um and that presumably they don't lay it out, but presumably the reason for saying that would be because according to this presentation of the facts, Beit Shammai thinks that gold isn't money at all. The reason they won't let you exchange your silver for gold is because they think gold's not money. And if gold's not money at all, then you can't exchange your your wheat or your grapes or your whatever it is for gold either because you can only use money to redeem Master Shem. Okay, but the Gemara doesn't Nor has a question about that. And it says, Adamiflage bislaim al dinarim, leaflog beperot al dinar. So it says, well, if it's true that Beit Shammai doesn't actually let you redeem anything with gold, it doesn't let you exchange your silver coins for gold, but he also won't let you redeem the fruit for gold. Why didn't the Brita, why didn't the Mishnah present the dispute to begin with as a dispute about whether you can use gold to redeem your fruit? That seems like the, I don't know, the original locus of the conversation. It seems like like a good place to, to ask the question. And the Gemara says, well, if it did that, if if it presented the dispute as a dispute about whether you can redeem food using gold coins, then hava amina hani mili beperot al dinarim. I would say, I might say, the dispute is only about whether you can redeem fruit with gold coins. And Beit Hillel says you can redeem fruit with gold coins, and Beit Shammai says you can't redeem fruit with gold coins. But about bislaim al dinarim. But I might think that when it comes to exchanging silver coins for gold coins, Beit Hillel would concede the point to Beit Shammai, and nobody would let me exchange silver coins for gold coins. And I wouldn't understand the depths of Beit Hillel's belief that gold is money, that Beit Hillel even allows me to exchange silver coins for gold coins, because they think not only is gold money compared to food, but gold is also money co when compared to silver. But I might think that instead that Beit Hillel thinks did the hava gabe kaspa pera hafe that gold is uh, merchandise when it's compared to silver, and so we wouldn't redeem it. That would be an incorrect conclusion, and so the Mishnah is being described in terms of the question of whether you can get change. Whether you can uh, not get change, I guess the opposite of getting change, handing in your smaller coins or bigger coins. Um, and it's being phrased that way because that's the place where I would otherwise make a mistake so that I'll know how powerfully Beit Hillel believes that gold is really money. Kamash Malan. So that, that, that's why it has to teach us that way. Okay. So remember that we had this dispute between Beit, Be sorry, between Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan about how to read the dispute between Beit Shammai and, and Beit Hillel. And we didn't know which was which of Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. So now the Gemara is going to try to figure out which one's which, based on the other things that we know about their beliefs. So the Gemara says, Tistaim the Rabbi Yochanan hu amar in mechalui. So it must be that we can conclude that it's Rabbi Yochanan who thinks that Everybody agrees. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Who thinks that Beit Shammai thinks that you can't redeem food directly with gold coins? The uh, second position that we listed. Um, which would be the position in which Beit Shammai believes that gold is just not money at all. 
in any way. Okay. And the reason we think that Rabbi Yochanan thinks this about Beit Shammai is because of the following. The Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Asur Lilavot Dinar Bedinar. Because Rabbi Yochanan is known to have said that it's forbidden to loan a gold dinar for a gold dinar. Well, a dinar for a dinar. I'm sorry. I, 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 I stepped on my line there. It, what he said is you're not allowed to lend somebody a dinar and get paid back a dinar. Now, we've discussed in the past, we discussed last week, that um, rabbinically, you're only allowed to lend people uh, money if if the pay, repayment is going to be of exactly the same amount of stuff as you lent out. You can't lend somebody a cup of sugar in return for exactly a cup of sugar back. Can't lend somebody a dozen eggs in return for exactly a dozen eggs back, etc. Because the um, concern is that the dozen eggs was worth, I don't know, $4 today. And by the time you give me back my dozen eggs, it'll be worth $4.10. And you will have, if we calculated it in money, which is what we're seeing as the the stable measure of value, um, then you would have actually paid me back an extra 10 cents and that would be interest. So as I mentioned last week, people, this has not stopped people from being neighborly over the course of the last 2000 years. Just the, the proper thing to do is not to use language like lend and borrow and I'll give you back exactly the same, right? It's, you know, to, to sort of have a more diffuse culture of sharing in which you try to give people back approximately what they gave you. But you can't have a, like a, bus a business relationship in which you're responsible to give it back exactly what you got with a commodity. Okay, so now when Rabbi Yochanan says you can't lend a dinar in exchange for getting back a dinar, it sounds like he thinks that a dinar, whatever that is, is a commodity rather than money. Okay, so dinar demai. What kind of dinar is this? Ilema dinar shel kesef. If if we said it was a silver dinar, because remember we had back in the exchange rates that we had about ten minutes ago, there are a dinar is a sort of a generic term, and there are both silver dinars and gold dinars. So if we say that it's a silver dinar, then be dinar shel kesef legabe nafshe miika laman de amar lav have. So is there actually anybody? Who thinks that silver isn't money when compared to other silver coins? That seems absurd. So the answer to that is no. Ella pshita dinar shel zahav, but dinar shel zahav. It must be that what he said you're not allowed to lend is a gold dinar to be paid back as a gold dinar. Ulaman. And according to whom uh, was Beit, Rabbi Yochanan saying this? Ila Beit Hillel, if it was Beit Hillel, then Ha'amri Tavahave. It can't be Beit Hillel because Beit Hillel thinks that gold is money. <laughs> so that's not going to work. El Alav, the Beit Shammai. It must, in fact, be that Rabbi Yochanan was talking according to Beit Shammai, and he was expressing the opinion that according to Beit Shammai, you are not allowed to lend gold coins in and be expect to be paid back in gold coins. Because that would take, that would carry with it a chance of interest, because the uh, value of gold is, according to Beit Shammai, in this theory, not stable. It's indexed to the value of silver, and therefore you might end up giving back more value than you got, and that would be interest. Okay. Um, so it must be that it's really Rabbi Yochanan who says that Beit Shammai says that you can't redeem um, fruit for gold coins because Beit Shammai thinks that gold is simply not money at all. Except that doesn't fly. No, in fact, you could also say that Rabbi Yochanan is the one who thinks that Beit Shammai says that gold is money and you can redeem uh, fruit with it. Because I have a way of explaining that Rabbi Yochanan that isn't, that doesn't require me to say that Rabbi Yochanan thinks that gold isn't money, according to Beit Shammai. 
Shani halva de kevan de leinyan mekachu memkar shavyuhu rabanan ki peire. It might be that loans are different. Because it might be that fundamentally, normally, most of the time, gold is actually money. And the rabbis just made this special rule that when you compare gold to silver in purchase and sale, we're going to treat gold as a commodity, even though normally it's not, normally it's money. And the rabbis said, well, that's going to be really confusing if it's a commodity in purchase and sale and it's money in in lending people will get the idea that you can borrow commodities that's not good so that that they might have said you're not allowed to borrow a gold dinar and pay back a gold dinar not because gold isn't money but because we told you you have to treat gold as a commodity in purchase and sale and we don't want people getting confused about whether you can lend a commodity or not. Right? So Shani Halva Kevan de Linyan Mekahumemkar Shavyuhu Rabanan Kipere. Loans are different because for the purposes of purchase and sale, the rabbis said you have to treat gold as merchandise. Diamrinan, Ihu, Nihu, de Okir Vizil, because they said for the purposes purposes of purchase and sale, when the value uh, the relative value of gold and silver changes. We're going to treat it as the value of gold changing, um, which seems to be at least in part designed to protect the uh, stability of the value of silver on which everything else here seems to rest. So therefore, legabe halva name perehave. So they also made it merchandise or commodity, whatever you want to call it, for the purposes of lending money. Hachanami Mistabra, this also makes sense. The Chiata Ravin Amarabi Yochanan, because when Ravin came, now remember Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, who are the two guys who've been interpreting Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel for us, they are early Amoraim in the land of Israel. And most of the action in our Gemara is happening in Babylonia. And there are a couple of characters, including sometimes Rabbi Yochanan himself, but there are a couple of characters who travel back and forth between the two uh, learning centers and bring news back and forth of um, what the rabbis are teaching. At the in They bring news to Babylonia of what the rabbis are teaching in Israel. Presumably they bring news the other direction also, but since what we're reading is the Babylonian Talmud, we're not going to see that most of the time. Um, and Ravin is um, one of these uh, characters who travels back and forth. When Ravin came, he said that Rabbi Yochanan said, dinar bedinar. He said, even though it is forbidden <laughs> to lend a gold dinar with the expectation that you will be paid back a gold dinar, nonetheless, nonetheless, he says, you can use gold coins, a gold dinar, to redeem your Maser Shani. So it seems like he explicitly says that whoever it is that he thinks doesn't allow you to lend gold dinars, if we're going to assume that's Beit Shammai, let's assume it's Beit Shammai, but whoever it is believes that you can, in fact, redeem Maser Shani with gold coins, which has to mean that Rabbi Yochanan then thinks that the more stringent position in the dispute between the Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai has to still allow you to redeem the fruit of Maser Shani directly onto a gold coin. <laughs> Therefore, he cannot be the person who said that Beit Shammai says you can't. So we seem to have finally concluded that it is Rabbi Yochanan who says that Beit Shammai thinks that gold is relatively money. It is money such that you can redeem fruit onto it, but it is not as much money as silver, so you can't redeem the holiness that's in the silver coins by trading them for gold coins, it, which is to say he thinks that the dispute is only about exchanging coins, not about the fruit which is going to mean that it was Reish Lakish who held the other position, 
that Beit Shammai thinks that you can um that you can't even redeem your fruit directly onto gold coins. Now notice that we're having here a dispute that's almost entirely about what Beit Shammai's position is. Even though we don't rule like Beit Shammai, we almost never rule like Beit Shammai. And yet we are devoting an enormous amount of time and energy to trying to backform exactly what Beit Shammai's position was when they were arguing with Beit Hillel, who we knew from the beginning we were going to rule like. But that, that's pretty normal. Um, okay, Shema Mina. Shema, that seems to indicate that the argument is over. The argument's not over. We will be continuing it after Sukkot because um, we're not done with this. But the argument is at least temporarily over. Um, it's over enough that it's a stopping point in the Gemara and we can stop here. Um, okay, we have questions. That was a mouthful. Um, I just have a comment, mm -hmm. which is that... Uh... The um, the relative exchange rates of gold and silver were an issue uh, for for traders who went between different countries, you know, for a long time, even into the uh, Middle Ages and beyond. Sure. And there, I, I think I, there was actually, I think, uh, some people who made a, a lot of money by noticing that the exchange rate between gold and silver was different in Europe and in China. And they could take advantage of that to uh, make some money um, going back and forth. Yeah, and the Gemara clearly knows that because it said that it might be the reason you're not allowed to lend money, even if we think money is, that's right, you're not allowed to lend gold, even if we think gold is money, would be because we've had to make a concession in buying and selling to admit that the price of gold changes relative to the price of silver. But in order to protect silver as, as being stable, we're pretending that it's only the, the price of the gold that goes up and down. But the Gemara was sort of open about that. At the same time, both in terms of uh, issues of... Um, not charging interest and in terms of issues of uh paying your religious obligations and up to and including this sort of like redeeming fruit kind of thing it is very important to the gemara that they be able to at least pretend that money has stable value i i think it's obvious that they're aware that they're pretending um and also it's it's possible as long as you're only pretending it about one currency, it's possible to maintain that pretense for quite a long time. Um, we, in our world, manage most of the time to pretend that the dollar has a stable value and we compare everything else to it, even though you and I and everybody else know that that's not true. But it makes a handy comparison in order to you know sort of keep track of what's going on in the world um but but yes there's there's going to be a certain amount of uh imagination that goes into maintaining that that pretense okay anybody else Okay, so um, I want to welcome Rina, our, our new person here. Um, and I also want to note, uh, and I'll send out an email about this also because not everybody's here. I want to note that we are now going to go on hiatus until after the Chagim, um, because without weekends to prepare on, I'll have nothing to say on Monday nights. Um, so I will see all of you guys, um, not the monday that's like the day after simchat torah but the one that's a week after that um and i'll as i said i'll I'll send an email with the with the date um and thank you very much have a shana tova gmar khatima tova chag sameach another chag sameach and i'll see you in about a month chag sameach
Thank you, Deborah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.